Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord Jesus, make us worthy to celebrate the exaltation of your glorious cross with sacred hymns and psalms. When you appear on the last day, and the sign of your holy cross will shine brighter than the sun, gather us before you, and surround us with your eternal light, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit forever. Peace be with the church and her children. Raise glory, honor, and praise to the Savior who made the wood of his cross a strong fortress for his flock and established it as a sign of the covenant for the salvation of his inheritance. By his cross he exalted his church and gave joy to all people who believed in it. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast and all the days of our lives and forever. Amen. O Christ our God, by your precious cross you have given us perfect salvation, and you have made us worthy to celebrate this feast with hymns of praise proclaiming. O blessed are you, O wood of the Holy Cross, for you erased Adam's curse and restored his banished children to their inheritance. Blessed are you, O Holy Cross, for you united heavenly and earthly beings. Blessed are you, O Holy Cross, for you fulfilled the words of the prophets, enlightened the apostles in their preaching, crowned the martyrs for their faith, and honored the confessors for their loyalty. Now, Christ our Savior, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense, to make the celebration of the feast of the exaltation of your holy cross a sign of security and peace. By your cross exalt your holy church, guide her shepherds, adorn her priests with virtue, purify her deacons, help the elderly, educate children, direct the youth. Protect orphans, care for widows, and grant rest in your dwellings of light to our brothers and sisters who have died hoping in you. May we find refuge in the shadow of your cross on the great day of your second coming, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit forever.
people's candle far from her, keep her free from harm and strife, that your lasting peace may reign for all ages yet to come. May the children of the church find their shelter and their strength in the shadow of your Jesus Christ, our Lord, accept these prayers and the fragrance of this incense that we have offered on the feast of your exaltation of your holy cross. May its sign always be visible before our eyes to strengthen us, that we may walk with you toward death and then stand at your right hand to celebrate the feast of your eternal victory. We glorify you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. through the power of your cross. Cross is a matter leading us to heaven's heights. May your church and her children join the angel hosts on high. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God decide this end upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and your children forever. Brothers and sisters, let love be sincere. Hate what is evil. Hold on to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Anticipate one another in showing honor. Do not grow slack in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Endure in affliction. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the Holy Ones. Exercise hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Have the same regard for one another. 
Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be concerned for what is noble in the sight of all. If possible, on your part, live at peace with all. Beloved, do not look for revenge, but leave room for the wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Rather, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals upon his head. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. Praise be to God always. Alleluia. Alleluia. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved. Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Saviour, announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Shlomo el kolechun, from the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Saint Matthew, who proclaim life unto the world. Let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. The Lord Jesus says, And when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit upon his glorious throne, and all the nations shall be assembled before him. And he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right hand and the goats to his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me to drink. A stranger, and you welcomed me in. Naked, and you covered me. Ill, and you cared for me in prison, and you visited me. And then the righteous shall answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you in, or naked and cover you? When did we see you ill or in prison and visit you? And the king shall say to them in reply, Amen, I say to you, whatever you did for one of these least brethren of mine, you did for me. And then he shall say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, 
and you did, give, did not give me to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. A stranger, and you gave me no welcome. Naked, and you gave me no clothing. Ill and in prison, and you did not care for me. And then they shall answer and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or ill, or in prison, and not minister to your needs? And he will answer them, Amen, I say to you, what you did not do for one of these least, you did not do for me. And these shall go off to eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the truth, peace be with you. Praise and blessings to Jesus Christ, our Lord and God. Forgive me us his words of life. Praise and blessings to Jesus Christ, our Lord. And all the nations will be assembled before him. In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, amen. Christianity, as we well know, is a person and not a school of philosophy or a school of thought. That actually came up quite well, nicely, artistically portrayed when we did catechism on Friday with the adults and the high school kids. Because we use the image that you all know of the fish, the outline black drawing of this symbolized of the fish, and we ask them, what does this actually mean? And of course, the answer that comes back, and most people, and it's not false, is to say, well, it represents Christianity. It's not false in itself, but in fact, that's not what the symbol represents. It does by extension, but it actually represents, it's an acrostic. And the word for fish is ichthys. And you take each of the letters of the word for fish, and in Greek it actually says, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. That's what the fish actually represents. It doesn't represent Christianity as a thought. It represents the person of our Lord. And that is precisely a very good truth of the fact that Christianity is not like Buddhism or Islam. It's not an idea. It's not a field and a way to think. It is subsequently, but it is fundamentally, essentially, and intrinsically a person. Now, we know this. We learn this in catechism. But what happens is then we usually translate that into human conditions. And then it becomes this emotional thing. Well, well Jesus has to be like my best friend and the center of my life. And we kind of then do these emotional gymnastics where somehow I have to always be thinking as if we were thinking about a colleague at work or somebody at school. And this has to just be like the number one person. And of course, that's a, a lot of like a lot of modern, a lot of times evangelical approaches. Jesus is number one. Well, this is absolutely true. But it's because Jesus is God, divine wisdom incarnate. And that presence is, yes, central and is a person. He's both God and man. This is all true. But this is an not emotional attachment, first and foremost. It's a bit like we've talked oftentimes transforming Christmas into Jesus' birthday and singing happy birthday to Jesus. That's fine. It's a bit infantile, in my opinion, personally. But it also misses entirely what December 25th is, which is a commemoration of the entrance of divine wisdom into the human race through the incarnation. It's more than just celebrating a birthday of a guy who just happens to be 2,021 years old at this point, I guess, and that you just, ha you, they, are not, they are not people in the sense of the person you work with. 
And this is a very important point linked with the notion and the doctrine of Christ the King. Because this person that we are related to, that we are baptized and consecrated into, is first and foremost the divine wisdom that is given to us. Christ is given to us in that luminosity of the faith. And that faith is sealed by the giving of the Spirit. This relationship we have is not a human relationship. It is a divine relationship, which is why it transforms us It's not like having someone that we are personally attached to at work or at school, as I said. But it is a transfiguration of the eternal one who appears to us in life, who is given to us in faith. And in that illumination, the sealing and the character that is given to us within the spirit of holiness, this is why we are transformed by this personal relationship. It is the reason why to explain the icons, when we've talked about them, of the Oreo, when we have this kind of unusual shape, oftentimes like an almond, which is why we call it an Oreo, this almond shape, because what it is is the veil being opened to reveal to us the presence of our Lord here and now. It is why in the icon, of course, the one on the banner and the one over the gospel, they're both the same icon. But they're both, and the one that is slightly different because all the icons are coming from a historical canon, a standard from which the iconographers will paint. So they'll be slightly different, but you'll have some of the same symbolisms. But the importance of what it's revealing to us is not something in the future. The icon of Christ in glory is revealing to us that this presence, that the veil of heaven is open to manifest that reality to us. The reason why I bring this up is because oftentimes, and especially, again, in, these last, in this last century, Christianity has kind of like puddled out into this effeminized, eviscerated sentimentality. Now, obviously, there's emotions associated with Christianity, but emotions in a human being are rather low in the rank of who we are as persons. We have an intellect that thinks. Remember the axiom, to see, to judge, to act. Because the second faculty power that we have is the ability to choose among goods. The ability to love, ultimately, is that that means. So the ability to know what is true, to see and to perceive and to bring within our being the intellect, the will, the ability to choose among goods. And then, of course, as part of our lower nature, the kind of concrete part of us, That concrete aspect is where we have imagination and emotions and feelings and all that. And there's nothing wrong with them. But as you've all learned in life, we don't have control over our emotions. If I feel sad, I feel sad. If I'm happy, I'm happy. I do have complete control out of how I express those emotions externally, but that's a different thing. So the idea of turning Christianity into a sentimental thing or an emotional thing is completely artificial. You cannot generate emotionality nonstop. You just burn out. Can't walk around making myself feel giddy all the time. It's goofy. And it's not as an impress anyone because you're like, well, this person just lost their mind, you know? There's all kinds of people that run around up and down, you know, rooms and halls of asylums giggling, but it's not something you want to imitate. When we receive Christ in our life as this personal relationship, this is the divine life of Christ the King that is given to us in the reception, that is confirmed and sealed by the giving of the Spirit of Holiness. And this Trinitarian presence within us is what transfigures us in our first our minds and our spirits. And then in the strengthening and the discipline of our will. This is why the bulletin this week is all about reintegration. How do we make ourselves whole? How do we learn to discipline ourselves so that our lives are regular, so that our lives are disciplined, so that our lives are the pursuit of virtue and goodness and ultimately holiness? Because we're disciplined, we can actually hear the voice of God. This is Christ the King. And the emotions that flow from that, that sense of awe and majesty, And even on occasion, the overwhelming emotion of just gratitude and love, those are all wonderful things, but they flow from first the mind and the will. 
They flow from the spirit into our lower nature and the emotions are transformed. So we don't just become sapi. The modern world is sentimentalistic. Sapi, it's in cliches. You see it on billboards. You get it in advertising. At least in the 19th century when they started doing advertising, at least you had a couple paragraphs to try to tell you why you should buy this product. It was an appeal to your mind. Now it is a complete appeal to your emotions. You put a pretty woman on the screen, have her run around a bit, and then go swoosh. And so this advertisement doesn't say anything to you. It's just to incite some kind of feeling. You drink this beer and it will make you buff with great pecs. Oh, and that blonde, yeah, you'll win her around the pool. N nothing else is in the story. It's just pictures to emote, to make you emote. That is the complete opposite of Christianity. We have degenerated ourselves to such a low level. We don't even know that we're in this kind of morass of being suffocated by marshmallows. But this is our modern cultural setting. And the reason why we bring this up is because Pius XI, already the beginning of the 20th century, after at this point almost 150 years of revolution, saw the unraveling of the principles of the gospel falling out of human interactions in human social and human public order. So the doctrine of Christ the King has always been present in the church. If you read the Acts of the Apostles, you see St. Paul being arrested for teaching there is another king called Jesus. It is part of our Lord's passion. Are you king of the Jews? This notion of kingship is not about crowns and scepters and ermine. Kingship is about leadership and governing and directing and protection. When we speak about our Lord as king, you have to kind of get some of the images that we've had in our heads, which are romanticized in a certain sense, that are too middle medieval in a sense. So I explained to you the icon in the beginning, that Christ the King is a present reality here and now. And that light that radiates out from the intellect through the will, down through our lower natures, is exactly the order of the day of the resurrection. It is because the spirit has been transfigured by grace that the body will rise from the dead. It's not a separate thing, it is the continual transfiguration of the individual. And that's why the individual who has not been transformed by grace here and now will not be risen in glory from the dead. It's not something separate. It is the consequence that flows from the transformation of the spirit. This is the doctrine of Christ the King. It has always been taught. It has always been the way Christians lived. It is what transformed our families. It is what transformed our relationships. It is what transformed our marriages. It is what transformed our education. It is what transformed our arts. It is what transformed our laws. It is what transformed everything that made those so-called Middle Ages be what they were. Not because of who they were, but because of the principles by which they thought by which they judged and by which they acted. Now in the late 1700s with the revolutions that exploded in North America and in the European continent, these revolutions completely dumped everything on its head in principle and ultimately worked out continually generation to generation in what we now call secularism. The idea that somehow the human being can live as if God didn't exist and then when you go home, yeah, say your rosary with your family. And this is totally schizophrenic because the individual by definition is also social. We have interactions with people. And the same way that we are transformed individually and personally, it transforms our relationships with others. To somehow say that all of my public relationships have to be as if there was no God, and then whatever I do personally at home is fine, make it up yourself 
is just schizophrenic. That's not how a human being lives. And that is why what you watch with that idea being launched into a society is ultimately all those people also with the backwash, all those people individually live as if there was no God. You start to pretend that socially we can live as if there's no God, no direction, no principles, no gospel. It's all up to pure philosophy, whatever that's supposed to mean, to direct our public actions. And personally, you have your religion locked into your house or into your head. That is complete contradiction to the Catholic doctrine. And throughout the 19th century, you have this constant back and forth that goes and further revolutions and further secularization and further crumbling of a Catholic vision of what had transfigured the pagan Greek and Roman world in the Mediterranean basin which is why by the time you arrive at the beginning of the 20th century, the popes are really in quite a frantic state. Well, frantic is probably not a good word. They are quite concerned because there has been now over a century of this unraveling. That's why I've told you, St. Pius X at the beginning of the 20th century asked himself out loud whether or not the Antichrist was already born into the world, like in 1906. And in 1925, 20 years later, his successor, Pope Pius XI, instituted the Feast of Christ the King in order to put into value what the doctrine of the kingship of Christ actually means. Because he already noticed how far the world has, was collapsing. This is the generation of your grandparents, your great-grandparents, and for some of you, your great-great-grandparents. And the Pope's understanding, because you judge things to see and to judge and to act, is to see and to judge by principles. And the principles indicated how everything was already unraveling at that point. You live through the final remnants of this unraveling in the 21st century. But a century ago, the popes were already trying to re-clarify the Catholics' minds. Because if the Catholics go down the tubes, everyone goes down the tubes. You are the salt of the earth. If the salt loses its savor, it is good for nothing except to be trodden on by the feet of men and beasts. We wonder why the Catholic Church is being bruised and beaten and humiliated so much. Well, because the salt has lost its savor. And the savor of the salt, that preservation in generation to generation, is the understanding of what the gospel is doing to our lives here and now today, and how it transforms all of our relationships. This is the doctrine of Christ the King. Christ the King is not an eschatological reality waiting for the last day. That was something we did to the feast in the 1960s. In 1925, you can read it, the encyclical. You can find it online. It's called Quas Primas. 1925, it's very beautiful. Pius XI did three things. Well, he did more than that. But he did three magnificent encyclicals. One on, Catholic edu on Christian education. One on Christ the King. And one in 1930, 31, on Catholic marriage. What does Christian marriage look like? He saw in the 1920s what was happening. Education of the young, Catholic families, Christian families, and what the fundamental doctrine of both of those aspects of Christ the King. And that is why he set the Feast of Christ the King on the last Sunday of October. That lasted for 40 years. And in the late 60s, when the calendar was reformed in the Latin church, they moved the feast from October to the end last Sunday of the year. Now, we've talked about this probably only in sermons during the week. So I'll give it to you today. That move at the end of the 60s, only barely 40 years, just over 40 years after Pope Pius XI, the moving of the feast from the end of October to the end of the liturgical year was not a small thing. You learn by the liturgy. You learn by what you do annually. Your children are trained about Martin Luther King every January. 
And that's fine in the secular world. But you learn from these days coming back. You learn from Christmas coming. You learn from New Year's. You learn it as a child. You just absorb it. That's what the liturgical year is. Pope Pius the Ninth, Pope Pius the Eleventh, excuse me, put the Feast of Christ the King on the last Sunday in October because in the Latin calendar, that is the Sunday that will occur most often closest to the Feast of All Saints. And because the doctrine of Christ the King is about the here and now and the reality of the transformation of grace in this personal relationship that we have with the divine word incarnate, it is in the saints that we see the fulfillment of Christ's kingship in the transformation of spirit and of mind and of will. And so he wanted the doctrine to be highlighted in its proximity to the celebration of all saints of where the king has truly been most successful. And that is in the lives of the saints. That is why. So for us as Maronites, it's always been at the end of October, and this is also the last day of our liturgical year. We begin a new liturgical year next week with the consecration of the church. So it always remains here. I don't know if our Maronites had a longer, if they would have also shifted in in the 70s, I don't know. But the shift was a major event because what it did was not just change the day, it changed the meaning of the doctrine. Because the doctrine meant that Christ will be king at the end of the world, which of course is true, but it is much more than that. And that is why what also happens simultaneously, which you will not have any awareness of because you don't go to Vespers. But in the Latin church, what they did is they changed the office in the late 60s. And the verses that were in the hymn on the feast of Christ the King that made reference more along the lines of, so shed your grace and light upon us and transform the laws of our nations. May your gospel be the source of our arts and your grace and salvation be within the minds among the nations politically. This is basically those verses. And so because in order to make it very clear that this was now an eschatological reality and not a reality taking place day to day, year to year, it was moved to the end of the year and because it was moved to the end of the year and eschatologically was meant to be the doctrine, those verses had to be and were removed from the hymns. This is not a small thing. This is huge. And it is something that counterweights and to some degree contradicts the doctrine of Pius XI. I know what I say to you is scandalous, but I did not do the scandal. I'm only illuminating your mind so that you understand really the combat that you are to live as Catholics in the 21st century. None of this is easy. And I can assure you it is not easy to be a priest either in the apostolic tradition to bring these things out. But it's important as we celebrate the Feast of the Christ the King, this is about the Lord Jesus, King of Kings and Lord of Lords who transforms our lives by the light that is given to us in our spirits, that strengthens our wills to become ordered and disciplined in that holiness of the gospel. And transfiguring us personally, it necessarily must transfigure the way we act with one another, the way that we are acting as families, as societies. And with that understanding, now you can see why the gospel. When you did not do these things to, for me, or you did not do this to the least of my brethren, you did not do it for me. It is linked together that the kingship of Christ is this transformation here and now. There is no vision of secularism within the Church of Christ. It doesn't exist. How can you have the idea that humanity exists in some way as if God didn't exist? There is nothing in creation that escapes from God. He is the origin of its very existence. This is the doctrine of Christ the King. This is the questions that are asked of our Lord at his passion. Are you truly King of the Jews? He is King of everything. So read Quas Primas, it is beautiful. And it will give you a better understanding of what the church's vision of the transformation of grace is. And for us here today, well, let us render gratitude to God for having touched our spirits by his grace having given his person to us in order to transfigure us. And in that gratitude, we ask for the strength that we will be faithful day in 
and day out, morning and night, being transfigured in grace, walking on the path of all the saints, and hopefully someday we may find ourselves among their ranks. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord in God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors, 
Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. Amen. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, our Holy Father, Saint Mary, Saint Jude, and Saint Epimachus. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. contrary to your will. May we who have remained in your divine love be made worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with a holy kiss. May we always speak words of peace, think of peace, and work for peace. Through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people, we raise glory to you and to your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to our neighbor with love and faith, which is pleasing to the Lord. From all creation, you are peace, reconciling those who are enemies. You are forgiveness to those who sin, and you are comfort to those who are sorrowful. 
Open the door of your mercy to our petitions, and in the abundance of your grace accept our prayers. Make us children and heirs of your kingdom through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people, and through your Holy Spirit, now and forever. bless you, humanity exalts you, and all creation glorifies you. Look upon your children who call out to you. With purity and holiness, may we offer you an acceptable sacrifice, that we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Father, in the grace of the only begotten Son, and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit. Let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. right and just to thank, adore, glorify, and bless the majesty of the one consubstantial Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a majesty that does not need our glory or become greater with our thanks. O Lord, those who sing your praises are countless, and they cry out with angelic voices and with sweet melodies proclaiming. Can come. 
comprehend that you willingly emptied yourself of your divine glory? Who can explain your miraculous birth from a virgin? Who can repay you for your saving passion which you freely endured? Who can praise your plan of salvation for us? We can only ask of you, O lover of all people, that this sacrifice which we have offered be accepted on your altar in heaven, the dwelling place of your hidden divinity, in the company of the angels and saints. Through this sacrifice may we be worthy of the forgiveness of our sins. When you come to judge the living and the dead, do not pass judgment upon us, nor deny us, saying, I do not know you. On that glorious and fearful day, do not separate us from you, nor cast us out of your paradise to a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Rather, because of your holy name by which we have been called, look with mercy upon us. In your compassion you have made us worthy of the gift of your forgiving body and blood. So make us worthy to be one with you in holiness as you are one with your Father. For this your church implores you and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, <coughs> Mercy on us, Almighty Father, and mercy on us. As we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we profess our faith in you, and we ask you and compassion on us, so God, and mercy on us, and hear us. How awesome is this moment, O oh my beloved! For the living Holy Spirit descends and rests upon this offering for our sanctification. Let us stand with reverence as we pray. Manin monio, manin monio, manin monio, nite moro rohu chayu kodisho, onachem nalainu al korbono ono. body of Christ our God be for us a pledge of life to come, a body that grants us the everlasting joys of heaven, a body that renews our souls and bodies, a body that purifies us of all sins for eternal life. Amen. And that the mixture in this chalice, the blood of Christ our God, be a blood that gives new life to those who receive it, a blood that guides us to the safe harbors and the dwellings of light, a blood that renews our souls and bodies, a blood that purifies us of all sin for eternal life. Amen. O Lord, in your great mercy, when this body and blood is mingled with our bodies and souls, Grant that it may be for the pardon of faults, the forgiveness of sins, and for the everlasting joy and eternal life with all your saints. Amen. We offer you, Lord God, this pure and holy offering for your holy, Catholic, and apostolic church, which you have redeemed. Gather her children into unity, love, and faith, and guide them in peace and security. We offer it for the pure bishops of the true faith, Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bashar of Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, the Venerable Priests, the Chaste Deacons, the Pure Subdeacons, and all the Orders of the Church. Teach them the word of truth so that they may spread it faithfully with justice and holiness. May they care for the flock that you have entrusted to them. Give them the proper means to accomplish your will and grant them a long life. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor and dejected, 
for orphans and widows, for the sick and distressed, and for those tempted by evil spirits, be the guardian and refuge of their lives. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember the holy fathers, prophets, apostles, preachers, evangelists, martyrs, and confessors, especially the holy, glorious, and blessed ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of God, St. John the Baptist, the messenger and forerunner, who witnessed the betrothal of your holy church to your son, glorious St. Stephen the Archdeacon and first martyr, and all who pleased you and professed your name, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all the faithful departed who have gone to you from this altar and from every place throughout the world, Grant them rest in your heavenly dwellings with all your saints, and in your mercy forgive our sins and theirs. Grant rest, O God, to the departed, and forgive the sins we have committed, with or without full knowledge. O Lord, do not deprive us of your mercy, but keep us in the palm of your hand, lest we fall and go astray so that we may walk on your paths, follow your ways, and do your will. Forgive us and our departed, and pardon all sins and transgressions hidden and seen, committed with or without full knowledge. Make us worthy of a faithful Christian death that is pleasing to you, and join us to your righteous ones and to those who have done your will that in all and in all things your blessed name may be glorified with the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. As it was, is now, and shall be forever. of your eternity and he accomplished his plan of salvation for us that we may come to you may we call upon you with the prayer that he taught his holy disciples saying our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Yes, O merciful Lord, we ask for your compassion. By your grace, make us worthy, that your glorious name may be made holy in us, that your kingdom come to assist us in our weakness, and that your will dwell within us. Deliver us from all difficult temptations, 
For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, with your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Shlomo el kolichonu, wa'am rucho dilo. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake of him, and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord God, you are good and the lover of all people. Look upon those who bow their heads before your majesty and bless them with every spiritual blessing. Do not turn us away when we approach your divine and holy gifts, and let us not be guilty of unworthily receiving the body and blood of your only Son. Rather, make us worthy to share in your holy and life-giving mysteries with purity, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your good and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your Spirit, let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility, and ask Him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for He is one in heaven and on earth. To Him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory.
again and again we thank you, O oh Lord, and we raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink, the lover of all people. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, O oh Lord. Look at the passion of the Lord Jesus, you have made us worthy to share in your holy body and in the cup of salvation. How can we repay you for these, your gifts and graces, and for your goodness? As you have called us to approach this, this life-giving banquet, make us worthy, so that your body may be mingled with our bodies and your blood with our souls, for the pardon of faults, the forgiveness of sins, and for eternal life. You are blessed and your kingdom is holy. And we raise glory to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Shlomo elukuruchun, wa'am rucho O oh God the Father, we bow before you, and we entrust ourselves to your care. We ask you, imploring your mercy, to rest your right hand, full of blessings upon us. Assist us, protect us, bless us, and sanctify us by the life-giving cross of your only Son. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. 
Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. Amen.